Hi and welcome. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be looking at exponential functions in Math for Honors. Now, the assumption is, if you're doing this at the pre-calculus level, that you've been exposed to exponential functions a number of times at this point. We will be reviewing some of the basics, but we'll be moving through them quite quickly because, again, the baseline assumption is that you've probably studied exponential functions in your Algebra 1 course, probably in an Algebra 2 course as well. So this is our first sort of introductory lesson on them. Let's take a look at exercise one. Exponential functions are functions that can be written in the form y equals a constant times b to the x. So we've got that kind of form right up here. Now we can also shift functions vertically, shift that is exponential functions vertically, but that is at the base level what an exponential function looks like. Some constant times another constant raised to the input variable. Very important, right? So in exercise one, we see four examples of exponential functions where the a, the thing multiplying, is one. All right. So really, in this, in this situation, we're only trying to look at the effect of the base, right? Two, four, one half, and one fourth. Now this problem says use your calculator to sketch a graph of these things and label each with its equation. So pause the video right now and use your graphing calculator, if you need to, to graph each one of those. I would suggest using a window that is something on the order of maybe negative 5 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 5. And I think I would let my y values be something like this. Alright, so pause the video now if you need to and sketch those out and label them with their equations. All right, let's take a look. This problem, by the way, is not about learning how to sketch an exponential function. It's just to remind ourselves what they look like. <laughs> Maybe we need to remind ourselves of what axes look like. Anyway, here's our x-axis and our y-axis. If we were to graph y equals 2 to the x, what we'd see is we'd see a graph that looks something like this. Okay, I'm just going to label that 2 to the x. If we were to graph 4 to the x, we'd see almost the exact same curve with the exact same y-intercept, but it would be getting steeper much more quickly. So here we have 4 to the x. On the other hand, when the base became a number between 0 and 1, notice how careful I'm trying to be. Not when the base is a fraction. All right, 2 is a fraction. 4 is a fraction. But when we have y equals 1 half to the x, what we're seeing is we're seeing what's known as a decreasing exponential. So this would be 1 half to the x. If you noticed that 1 half to the x and 2 to the x are symmetric across the y-axis, you're correct about that. The same is true about y equals 1 fourth to the x and y equals 4 to the x. So here we've got 1 fourth to the x. So right away we notice something quite important about exponential functions. If we've got a simple exponential function, y equals b to the x, and b is greater than 1, then the exponential function will always increase. And if we have a situation where the base is between 0 and 1, then the exponential function will decrease. That should make all the sense in the world. When we have a function like 2 to the x, what we're doing is we're multiplying repeatedly by the number 2 over and over and over again, and that's resulting in our quantity getting larger. On the other hand, if we have something like 1 half, and we multiply repeatedly by that, in essence, what we're really doing is dividing by 2, and our function is getting smaller. All right. Notice, we don't talk about bases that are negative. We don't talk about a base of 1 y equals 1 to the x would just be y equals 1. We don't talk about bases that are 0. y equals 0 to the x would be just y equals 0. Not really exponentials. So we should now understand what the base does. It forces the exponential to either increase or decrease, assuming that a is a positive number. So in exercise 2, we want to simply ask, well, what is the role of a? If the role of b is to control the increasing, decreasing nature of the exponential, then what is the role of a? Pause the video for a moment and see if you can think of what role a plays. And let me give you a little hint. a is actually some graphical feature 
on an exponential function. The question is, what is the graphical feature? Pause the video. All right. Well, if you think really hard about it, a is the y-intercept of any exponential function. And of course, we can prove that. A is the y-intercept. How are we going to prove that? Well, we know that the y-intercept always occurs at x equals 0. So if I simply evaluate any exponential function that hasn't been shifted at x equals 0, of course, we know that any base raised to the 0 power is 1. Of course, we know our order of operations. We're going to raise b to the 0 before we multiply by a, and we get a y-intercept of a. So this point, 0 comma a, is always on the curve y equals a times b to the x. All right. So b controls whether the exponential increases or decreases, and a is its y-intercept. Where does it start? Take a look at exercise 3. It says the following graph shows that y shows four exponential equations, and we're supposed to match each equation to its graph, and we're not supposed to use our calculator. So go ahead and think about this a little bit. Pause the video and see if you can label each curve with its equation. All right, let's come back to it. Unfortunately, the problem could probably be structured a little bit better, right? Because these two, right, these two exponentials have y-intercepts that are bigger than these two exponentials. And in fact, these have the same y-intercept. Although it's not labeled, we can certainly say that this y-intercept is larger than this one. So these two curves must represent the ones that have y-intercepts of 10, whereas these two curves represent the ones where the y-intercept is 5. But which is which? Let's talk about these two first. How quickly an exponential curve increases is all due to how big its base is relative to the number 1. So y equals 5 times 2.4 to the x will increase faster than y equals 5 times 1.8 to the x. Simply put, multiplying by 2.4 forces a greater increase, a greater rate of change than multiplying by 1.8. So we can say that this is y equals 5 times 2.4 to the x, and this is y equals 5 times 1.8 raised to the x. I'm going to do a little bit of erasing just to get rid of you know, some arrows here that we don't particularly need, just to clean up our picture some. All right, now we'll go back to our pen. Hopefully we'll go back to our pen. Or not. Hmm. Interesting. Everything seems just a little bit frozen. I'm going to see if I can fix it ah. <laughs> by pausing the video. All right, let's get back to it. Not exactly sure what happened there, but let's analyze these two other curves. Now, we know that they both start at 10. The question is which is which. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of people kind of want to look at these two numbers and use the sort of logic that we used before and say, ah, well, 0.7 is bigger than 0.2, so it's got to decrease faster. Uh, that's not true, actually. The farther we are away from the number 1, the faster it will either increase or decrease, right? Think about it that way. Multiplying by the number 1 doesn't change anything, but multiplying by numbers greater than 1 makes it grow, and multiplying by numbers between 0 and 1, such as what we have here, makes the result sink or shrink. So if we multiply by 0.7, we're making it go down slower than if we multiply by 0.2. All right, so this curve will be our y equals 10 to the 0 0.7x, and this curve will be our y equals 10 times 0 0.2 to the x. All right. Now, one of the classic skills that you're supposed to pick up along the way is finding equations of exponential functions. And this is kind of cool. It is very similar to finding equations of lines 
but a little bit maybe more, I don't know, gimmicky? But watch how it's done. It's really kind of cool. And one of the nice things is it's always done in the same way. So in exercise number four, we're told that we have an exponential function that passes through two points, 6, 1,226, and 13, and 7,693. Sometimes exponential functions can grow really large really fast. And what we want to do is we want to come up with its equation in the form y equals a times b to the x. And we're going to round both of those parameters, not variables, parameters to the nearest tenth. Well, we're going to pull a trick that we often pull. If we know that points lie on a particular curve, we have permission to substitute them in. So I'm going to substitute those two points in. All right. I'm going to put the first one in. I'm going to put in 1,226 for y. And I'm going to put 6 in for x. The second curve, I'm going to substitute 7,693 in for y. And I'm going to put 13 in for x. Now, very often when you have a system of equations like this, you substitute one of them into another, you, you add them together, subtract them, something. I'm going to actually do something else with these two. I'm going to take equation 2, and I'm going to divide it by equation 1. All right, if we can add two equations together, surely we can divide them. When I divide equation 2 by equation 1, look at what happens. 7,693 divided by 1,226. That's on the left side. On the right side, I have a times b to the 13th divided by a times b to the 6th. Now, I bet you can already see how this simplifies, right? I can take my a's and cancel them because a divided by a is 1. Then I can say b to the 13th divided by b to the 6th, just using some exponent properties, is b to the 7th. But this is great, because now I can solve for b. It's the only thing left. And in fact, if I go down here to solve for it, I would find that b is going to be 7,693 divided by 1,226 to the 1 7th, or the 7th root, however you want to think about it. Now. When I put this into my calculator, it's going to give me a very messy answer. In fact, it's going to be 1.300, etc. I don't want to round that before I find A. Luckily, most modern graphing calculators allow you to store values or use your previous answer or something. So I want to take this value for B, unrounded, and put it either in this equation or in this one, it doesn't matter, and figure out A. So A, I'll put it into the first one, is 1,226 divided by my answer, 1.300, etc., to the sixth, right? And that's going to give me a value of A that is unrounded, 253.997, etc. What did I need to do? Round to the nearest tenth. So my final equation is y equals 254.0. And then it's very customary to write it this way, times 1.3 to the x. It's interesting because when you write an exponential this way with those parentheses, the parentheses literally look like they're doing nothing, right? And in a certain sense, they're, they're not doing anything because that 1.3 isn't doing anything. But what they do is they separate out the base, which is 1.3, from the coefficient, the 2.54, or sorry, the 254.0. We could easily write it without the parentheses, but then we'd put a little dot or multiplication symbol between the two. All right. Every time you find an equation of an exponential function, that's what you do. You substitute the two points in, you divide the two equations, you take a root, because the a will always cancel, you use the value of b to find the value of a. Very easy. All right, let's take a look at a little bit of exponential modeling. One of the reasons, many reasons, that exponentials are so important is that they can be used to model situations where the percent that a quantity increases or decreases remains constant. The percent increase is constant, or a percent decrease is constant. So let's take a look at a little bit of basic exponential modeling.
In exercise 5, it tells us that when Jonathan began work, his starting salary was $35,000. Each year it increases by a constant 2.5%, and we want to try to figure out a formula for Jonathan's salary as a function of the number of years, T years, that he's been working. If you think you remember how to do this, hit pause on the video right now and take a shot. All right, let's develop it. Now I'm going to show you a very standard development of how to get an exponential function. All right, I am going to assume that you sort of have some basic knowledge of percent work. So for instance, let's just pretend that we want to figure out Jonathan's salary after one year. The way that we would do that is we would take the $35,000 that he made his first year, we would multiply it by 0 0.025, so that would be his raise, if you will, right? That would be the raise. And then we would add that raise to Jonathan's $35,000. All right, fair enough. But I'd really like to be able to do that all in one calculation. So what most people learn is that we can factor that 35,000 out. We would have 0 0.25 plus 1. So we can actually figure out how much Jonathan makes in his second year or immediately after one year by multiplying by 1.025. Most students remember this by saying, well, look, you know, he's not losing his salary. So that 1 represents 100%. And that 0.025 represents 2.5%. So that's what Jonathan has after one year in terms of a salary. But after another year, we would get to multiply by 1.025 again, and another year again, and another year again. So eventually what we'd find out is that Jonathan's salary at the end of T years will always be 35000 times 1.025 all raised to the t. There we go. So after zero years, 1.025 would be one, to the t would be one, and we'd predict a salary of $35,000. After one year of working, we'd get to that 0.25 or that 2.5% raise. And each year after, we would get to multiply our salary by 1.025. Now, I know that many of you have had exposure to algebraic ways of solving exponential equations. Since we haven't covered logs yet in this class, I'm going to not use them to solve the next part of the problem. In fact, part B, it says, determine graphically the number of years to the nearest year it will take for his salary to reach 50,000. Now, anytime we're solving an equation, the first thing that I always want you to do is simply to write down the equation you're solving. In other words, I'm solving the equation 35,000 times 1.025 to the t equals 50,000. We can solve this algebraically using logarithms, but again, assuming that you haven't seen those yet in this course, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve it graphically on my calculator by graphing both of these curves. I'll put 1 in y1, I'll put 1 in y2, we'll look for a good window, we'll try to find the intersection point. Let's bring up our graphing calculator. I'm going to bring it over here so that we can see sort of the problem that we're trying to solve while at the same time solving it. Let's go into y equals. Let's clear out the functions that we have sitting there, if you have any. In y1, I'm going to put in the function 35,000, got to be careful, times 1.025 raised to the x. And I want to know where that intersects 50,000. That's a little bit tricky because, you know, we, we want to get the right window. Right? If we do a standard zoom, we're not going to see anything even remotely correct. Negative 10 to 10, negative 10 to 10. I mean, my goodness, he starts at $35,000, and we want to get up to $50,000. So we actually, ironically, know a little bit better about the Y window in this problem than the X window. So I don't know what the X window is. Remember, it's years. Maybe I go 0 to 10. That doesn't hurt. But let's try our Y window. Now, his lowest salary is $35,000. So maybe what I do is I just put in 30,000. 
We know that he's trying to get up to $50,000. Maybe I go a little bit higher, maybe 55000 There we go. Now that 0 to 10 may not be correct, but let's take a look. Ah, so here's my exponential function. And here's that horizontal line at y equals 50,000. Not quite enough, right? So let's go down. Why don't we open it up to 20 years? Boy, I hope he makes it in 20 years. There's my exponential. There's my linear. Well, my not so much my linear, but my constant function. So I'm now going to come down here. I think we'll, we'll hide this. Come down here and just do a little sketch. Right? And even though that exponential looked pretty linear on the screen, I think what I'll do is I'll kind of exaggerate it. Right? Something like this. Right? Maybe I'll label them both with their equations y equals 50,000. And this one, we'll save a little bit of time by not labeling them right now. <laughs> you know what I never did? I never actually found the intersection point, did I? And that's sort of the point, right? I need to go to calculate, go down to intersect, right? It asks me for my first curve, second curve, asks me for a guess. I put the cursor somewhere around the intersection point. And what does it tell me? 14.44, right? And 50,000. Let's go back here. So what I know is that is 14.4. Right, so to the nearest year, we're predicting that he'll reach 50,000. Whoops, to the nearest year at 14 years. Now we can get into some quibbles about should it be 14 or 15. Talk to your teacher about that. In my mind, sometime during the 14th year, he'd hit it, although it kind of depends on when Jonathan gets racist. Does he get it sort of progressively through the year? Does he get it you know, at the end of each year? That's, of course, contextual. All right, let's look at a decreasing situation. In exercise number six, we have the classic exponential decay problem, radioactive decay, like any high school student has ever experienced radioactive decay. And yet still, year after year, we talk about it. So we've got carbon-14, a radioactive material, decaying at a rate of 11.4% per 1,000 years. So every 1,000 years, we have 11.4% less than we did at the beginning of the millennium, the beginning of the thousand years. So we want to write a formula for the quantity Q of a 200 gram sample of carbon-14 remaining as a function of time in thousands of years. See if you can do that. Hit pause on the video and see what you get. All right, decay is always harder than growth. Because what you have to remember when we mathematically model exponential functions is that we are almost always modeling what remains. What remains, not what is decayed, not what's gone away, but what remains. So let, let's say, like, after a thousand years, right? After a thousand years, what remains is the 100% that we had minus the 11.4% that has decayed away. So after a thousand years, we have 88.6% that remains. That means that the quantity that we have, let's call it Q, maybe as a function of time, right? Every thousand years, we're going to multiply by 0.886. Every thousand years, we get to multiply by that. So we've got a T up there. Now the T is in thousands of years, right? So if I wanted to know what happened after a thousand years, I wouldn't want to put a thousand in there. I'd want to put in the number one. And we start with 200 grams. So maybe a little bit more space than we needed on this problem, but here's a nice function that's going to model for us how much we have remaining after t number of thousands of years. All right. Number seven then gets into a very chemistry-specific question. It asks for us to determine graphically the half-life of carbon-14 to the nearest hundred years. That's kind of neat. So the half-life, by definition, 
is how much time it will take for a radioactive material to decay so that only half of what's remaining is radioactive. Okay. Now, if you think about that, what that really means is that up here, we're trying to solve the following equation. We want to know when the amount of radioactive substance ends up being only 100. Eventually, what we're going to discuss in this unit is the fact that the half-life doesn't depend on what you start with. We could start with 50 grams, 100 grams, 100 kilograms. It wouldn't matter. The half-life will still be the same. That's kind of cool. That wouldn't be true if we were talking about linear quantities. So we're going to solve this the way that we did before. Maybe we'll put this in Y2. Maybe we'll put this in Y1. Why don't you take a moment, pause the video, see if you can construct a graph, and try to figure out how many years to the nearest hundred years it'll take for carbon-14 to decay down to half of its original amount. Pause the video. Alright, let's do it. Let's go back to the graph and calculate one more time. Again, let's get it so that it's, it's in your view. All right, maybe move it over here a little bit. Let's go into our y equals. Let's clear that down. Clear that up. Go back up. Here I'm going to type in my exponential function. You don't have to have a zero there, but I really like it. So 200 times 0.886 raised to the x. I know. You really want it to be raised to the t, but we're not going to do that for right now. We'll put in 100. Now, remember, x is already measured in thousands of years, so we don't have to make x huge, or maybe we do. You know, this is where it's a little bit challenging with the window, and one thing that I tell people to do, to play around with a lot, is to play around with the table. So maybe I'd go into my table, I don't know, starting my table at zero, going by ones, and maybe I would just glance. Now remember, by going by ones, I'm really going by thousands of year in intervals. So when we look at our table, really, we're looking for the values of y1, 2, if you will, cross the values of y2. Here, y1 is 200, y2 is 100, 177, 100, etc., right? And if you keep comparing these, what you see is that at 6,000 years, right, because that's really 6,000, this now drops below that. So one thing that's nice is I can say for certain that my window, eh, maybe I won't go 0 to 6, maybe I'll go like 0 to 7. 0 to 6 would certainly work, but I eh, don't want to really go there. I know I start off with 200, so maybe I'll make this a little bit, whoops, that's minimum y, not maximum y. Let me clear that out. Maybe I'll just make my minimum 0. Who knows? My maximum, right, the biggest it's ever going to be is 200, but maybe I'll go 250. So let's take a look at the graph now. I'm very choppy on the computer, but you can definitely see that intersection point. In fact, let's go for it right now. Let's calculate our intersection, choice 5. We like our first curve, our second curve, just put in our guess. And what we can now say, right, maybe we are required to draw the graph, maybe we're not. But what we found is that it intersects at t equals 5.727. Nearest 100 years. Well, if we wrote that out, remember, this is thousands of years. So if we wanted to convert it into literally something that looks like years, it would multiply by 1,000. So that would be 5,727. But maybe there's something about my model that isn't all that accurate. Maybe I don't want to take it out that far. So to the nearest 100 years, we have a half-life of 5,700. All right. Later, of course, we will be using logarithms and maybe even some other tools in order to solve these equations quicker perhaps than we can graphically. But there's nothing wrong with solving them graphically and it's kind of nice because then when you solve it graphically you can see that exponential decay, right? You can see the, the radioactive material getting less and less and then you can also kind of see, if you will, where it hits the level that you're interested in. In this case where it hits a level of, a, of 100. Alright, that's it for now. Until next time, remember, don't get into a staring contest with a llama. They spit. They're also, uh, you know, a little, little ugly looking. No offense to lungs. Don't want to hurt their feelings. All right. We'll see you next time, everyone. Good afternoon.